Well, it's a little chilly out here today as we uh, do the introduction here for class D, the Maxwell equations. Now, this class is going to look at the laws of electricity and magnetism all in one class. And we're going to start at first principles. We'll use some vector notation and introduce uh, some things uh, that involve uh, integrals with vectors and the main idea of this class that's uh, new compared to the traditional class is inspired by a book written by Purcell many years ago where he took an innovative approach to electricity magnetism where he derived the magnetic force field from special relativity. And what's really fascinating about electromagnetic theory is that the equations are in agreement with Einstein's theory of relativity. They provide the secret or a way to understand relativity. And relativity, basically Einstein's uh, theory of relativity in 1905, uh, clarifies the theory for us, the relativity theory, and we find that uh, electricity and magnetism, those equations, in a sense kind of helped because electromagnetic waves, people thought had to have ether to travel in. And Einstein said that's not true, that light propagates itself. Electromagnetic waves do not need a medium, and that's embedded in the Maxwell equations also. So it's not a surprise then that the Maxwell equations, uh, the laws of electricity and magnetism are in agreement with special relativity. If we can use relativity to actually derive the magnetic force field from uh, the electric field using the relativity idea. So it's a very, very deep theoretical physics class. And we'll come back to these equations again in our course. These equations are going to be the integral form of the equations. Typically, uh, that would be the form that is introduced in introductory physics classes. And then later, we'll look at the differential form and the relationship between electromagnetic theory and optics, since light is an electromagnetic wave. So I hope you enjoy this uh, very deep class. And when we mention derivation of the Maxwell equations, we're not really deriving them in a formal sense. We're showing how you can get the Maxwell equations from Coulomb's law and special relativity. Derivation in quotes, all right? So this is more of a holistic approach uh, to understand electromagnetic theory in one class in a unified way. Chapter D, Maxwell equations. These involve electricity and magnetism. A little intro here. Around 1800, we had the equation F equals MA, Newton's law, second law, and the universal law of gravitation, force of gravity, constant G, MM, two masses separated by R from center to center. And sometimes we'll put a minus sign there since this is an attractive force. And the electric force is very similar. Inverse square law, where there's a constant for electricity, electrical constant, and then a charge Q and little q, separated by distance R. So you can think of these equations as having like two bodies where R is the distance from the center to the center. And this is the mass m, little ass m. 
or you can say charge Q and little Q. And this can be attractive or repulsive if the signs are the same, there's plus and minus, there's two pluses, then they repel, two minuses repel, and a plus and minus attract. So we're gonna look at electricity and magnetism today, and we're gonna show that with relativity, special relativity, we're gonna be able to almost derive, or say, show how the electric and magnetic forces work. So let's go to D1. Gauss's law. So this equation in this form is referred to as Coulomb's law. And this constant K, it's a lowercase k, is sometimes written as one over four pi epsilon naught, where this is another constant. So you may see that form also. Notice that when you do F equals MA with these, you can then get problems to solve with dynamics. But let's look at this one for a second. Uh, here, if you take the M out of this thing, the force due to gravity, you would have little m, and then everything else we call little g. Now we looked at this already before. So we can see that g is then some force field where when you put a mass in it, it's attracted down to like the earth, that this is the earth, mass of the earth, and this will be pulling you down to the ground. With the electric force, you can do the same thing. You can take the Q out and have the Q times some E, where E is analogous to the G, the electric field, which would be K times big Q over R squared. And uh, these are force fields, the electric field and the gravitational field near the surface of the Earth. Gauss's law is an interesting way to express Coulomb's law. See, if you have a charge, Q, and we have some sphere, say some sphere here, then the electric field is given by the KQ over R squared, and we can make that a vector and have it point the baby vector, r hat, is a baby vector that always points away from the center. See, r hat, wherever you happen to be, r hat would point away. Since here, if you have a plus charge at any of these points, the repulsion would push you out. So this is a neat way to write it as a vector equation. i hat, J hat and K hat are typically reserved for X, Y, and Z. So here, if you have the X direction this way and the Y direction that way and Z a direction up, that would be the K. So we can say this is like X, Y, and Z. And R is like a spherical parameter. So if you make a little patch of area here, you can make an area patch, a vector, where you have the R hat and you have the DA. See, in other words, we're saying that if you have a little patch of area, this is the DA, and the vector points perpendicular, say, away from the center. So this would be like the direction that makes it a vector. So this is the magnitude and the direction. So once when you do that, you can do this cool thing where if you uh, look at the integration, if you integrate the electric field is constant at the same distance, r, away, and if you multiply by the surface area of the sphere, the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared, then you can write this as a fancy way 
of doing uh, an integral. Now this is gonna look a little strange, but we're gonna say by definition, this is what this means. What you do is you write the vector form for the E, which is uh, here gonna be, uh, you can write it as, actually you can write it as an E times a little r hat since it points away from the center. So it's some magnitude e, and the magnitude would be this thing here. This would be the magnitude e. And then here, the dA is by definition r hat dA. And when you have this dot product, remember your dot product, if you have the two vectors, a a vector and a b vector uh, here, and the angle theta, the definition of the dot product is to take a, b, cosine theta. So since the r points in the same direction as the other vector r, the cosine of uh, zero is one. And since the vector has one length unit, these are unit vectors are all like one unit in length, then r dot r is one times one times the cosine of zero, which is one. So this is a fancy way of writing one. And then if you were to uh, integrate, say here over E and DA over the enclosure, this would be the area, this is a constant, so you can pull the E out like this and then you're simply integrating the area of the sphere surface, the surface of the sphere, which is four pi r squared. So it's a fancy way of writing the equation, the, Coul the Coulomb equation. So we can write this as here, if we wanna go ahead and, and finish up this, this E, we said what the E is, it's this kq over r squared, so here, we're gonna write down KQ over R squared, and then this other stuff is four pi R squared. So here the R squareds cancel, and you get four pi K times Q. And if you wanna write this as the one over four pi epsilon naught, as we mentioned earlier, then the four pi's would cancel and you would get q over epsilon naught. So now you have this cool equation, if we come back to here, that if you take the electric field, and this is the dot product with the area, you get q over epsilon naught. And that q sometimes will go ahead and put down in to emphasize that it's inside the uh, the surface uh, or the vol you have a volume, but you're looking at a surface uh, area. And that is referred to as the first Maxwell equation, which is a fancy way of writing Coulomb's law, which is, just remember Coulomb's law, uh, one over four pi epsilon naught Q Q over R squared. So the first law of electricity and magnetism. To show you the power of this law, suppose we had a line of charge with density lambda. So there's like charges here. Watch this trick. If I make an enclosure, we're gonna make an enclosure here where this is a can and at the, at the distance, you know, R away, the electric field here, the electric field, this is all plus charges along here, then the electric field is gonna be pointing away from the central line. So that's the electric field pointing down, pointing up, and here it would just like skim the surface. So if you look at this thing, 
and consider this to be the distance, say L, then the charge density, uh, the definition of charge density is we would say it's the charge Q divided by a length L. So to say it's the charge, you have Q charge in that, say, distance. So if you apply this thing, see the area is the area of a cylinder because see at this point, remember the little dA always has the little vector pointing outward. So here the electric field would be perpendicular and it would not pierce out. So in other words, E dot that little vector would be zero. So you want the E that goes with the wraparound of a suit can, like this is the area, which would be, uh, here if you did this, the E would be constant along at that distance R, and you would have two pi R, that's the circumference, uh, times uh, the length L. Okay, that would be the charge that's on the inside. Uh, here, oh, it's on the right-hand side. That would be equal to the charge on the inside divided by epsilon naught. That's the other side here. So the, uh, the E is constant. So this is the area of the, like the label. Say if you had like a label around a suit can, you would have here two pi R times the length. So then you would find the electric field and see this is the electric field at a distance R away from the, uh, the line of charge would be equal to one over two pi R and you would have here Q on the inside divided by L and then one over epsilon naught. So you would have the one over two pi R L and then the Q on, uh, in over the epsilon naught. So this is the density, the charge density. So you would have the electric field at a distance away from a wire uh, to be this cool formula, one over two pi r lambda over epsilon naught. And that is so simple to work that out like that. If you had to do it the long way with this, you know, Coulomb's law and some kind of integration over uh, here, like the whole wire, like if you had, say, a little charge, you know, here, then the electric field there would be pushing, you know, at some angle. And then over here, you know, some other angle, boy, you have to integrate it all out. This gets the answer real fast, say. And that would be pointing out away from the wire. So if you want, you could put the little E of R and put a little R hat. Although this R hat is not the same as a spherical. This is like a cylindrical. And sometimes they'll use a row. Uh, for a cylinder. In other words, when you have like the polar coordinates in the cylinder uh, where you have uh, the row, some angle, uh, say phi, and then some z. This is your cylindrical language. But anyway, that's, the, that's your answer. Okay, now we come to D2, the magnetic field and the magnetic force. The magnetic field. Now I came across this uh, treatment in a, in a book for undergraduates, physics majors, the book Purcell, Edward Purcell, Electricity and Magnetism in Berkeley Physics Course, Volume 2, 1965. Introduction and this is amazing what they do here. They show you, you can get the magnetic, the magnetic field from special relativity. And here's how it's set up. Let's look at some wire here blowing up where you have these little circles which represent positive charge. You know, you remember that they had the big three, protons, neutrons, and electrons and the protons have a plus charge, plus one, say zero, and this is minus one uh, in, in units of the electric charge. And then let's say here, these that are gonna be filled in like this are the negative ones. 
And if current flows to the right, now I is often used as a current in engineering. And a current is the charge Q divided by T, like how much charge moves by per second. And if the positive current goes to the right, the negative are going to the left. We know that in the wire, it's the electrons that move and the ionic core is the positive charges stay put. So these are moving to the left, means the current moves to the right. And we're gonna look at a distance, say R, from the wire, and that will make that wire very, very thin later. We can consider that thin. So here, there's a mass M, and there's a charge little q. And if the charge is sitting there, and this is a plus charge, so this is a little plus charge sitting there. Notice that these charges cancel. The wire is neutral. Even when these move to the left, they all move at the same speed. They maintain their separation distance. And we know that to be the case that a wire just is not charged. But now if you start to move with a velocity V in this direction, now something strange happens because in relativity, from this frame, looking back, you're going to see the protons or the plus charges, these are the plus, uh, they're going to be moving to the left because you're moving to the right. Like you're like past these like bunch of trees and you're in a car going this way, trees going the other way relative to you. But the electrons are going to be going even faster to the left because they're already moving, say, in the wire. Then you're going to be putting your speed on there and you're going to get Lorentz contraction where there'll be more contraction for the electrons because they're traveling at a greater relative speed. And that means the negative charge will win out. And since you're positive, you're going to experience a force that's going to attract you to the uh, wire. But if you don't move, if you're at rest, you, you don't see the force. Like the force is not there. All right, there is no force. So the magnetic field, you respond to it when you move. Now, what is the uh, field that's going to set up, be set up by these, these charges? Well, if we look at these lines of charges, we know we have just done that a line of charge will have an electric field, one over two pi r lambda over epsilon naught. That's the general formula. But in this case, when we're in the moving frame, then we find that there's no can the, look at cancellation because the, uh, you know here in the lab frame, the, since the spacing is the same, your lambda you know will be a plus lambda and a minus lambda and all cancel. But in the moving frame, and we'll use the convention that we use prime, so we have a frame that's moving like this. It's prime frame. We would have here the electric field would be one over two pi r, and it would be a, a minus a charge density for the electrons, and I'll put the prime because we're in the moving frame, minus the plus effect. And what I did here is I put the, the, the uh, electron one first so that this, and these are like absolute magnitudes, uh, absolute magnitudes. Uh, I'll put the signs in by hand since the negative is going to here uh, have an effect that's going to uh, pull me in. I'm going to call, you know, pulling me in as positive. So the electric field, when it pulls up, that's positive. So the, when the electrons are negative, they're going to pull me up and the positive charges will push me, uh, push me away. So this could be greater than zero. And you could write down that vector E in that frame of reference is E prime, that magnitude, times J hat. And J hat's a cute little unit vector that points, points up like that. Now we have three frames here. We have frame K, which is the lab frame. That's us with, where, where the wire's at rest, we're with the wire. And then you have the K prime frame, which would be uh, the moving frame, the moving with 
V. So that's uh, that's the frame K prime moving with the, the mass, moving with the mass. The mass is moving. We're, we're with the mass. We're in that K prime frame. But I want to have another frame here, the K double prime frame, which should represent the electrons where the electrons are at rest. In other words, the electrons are moving, so this is where the electrons In other words, we ride with the electrons. And we'll say the electrons are moving with speed V naught. So in other words, a V naught here for the electrons moving to the left. So there are the three frames of reference. So the K frame, speed zero, we're in a lab, we're not moving. And then here moving to the right, speed V, and then moving with the electrons uh, this would be V naught to the left. And here we'll call the, the moving mass, we'll see the electrons move at some total speed, which is going to be, you know, electrons are moving this way, V naught, but the mass is moving this way at V, so we want to, it's going to be an additive effect, all right, uh, relative to the, to this, uh, say mass, if this mass were at rest, electrons moving V naught, but if I start moving this way, then they appear to be moving faster. And it's basically a V naught plus V relativistic addition. So let's remember the formula. When you add the two velocities, we did this before, you would get here V naught plus V over one plus V naught V over C squared. That's the formula we derived earlier. Now I'm gonna call that the total speed for the electrons, sort of a, a, a T. And then here we can use the notation beta is V over C kind of thing. And then write this as a beta. We basically divide uh, by C. If you divide by C, this becomes then V T over C, which is the beta T. This becomes beta naught, which is V naught over C. This becomes beta, which is V over C. And down here, the V naught over C is the beta naught, and the V over C is the beta. So you have this cool relationship. So what do we do with all this stuff? Well, we know that the lambda is going to be the charge over the unit length as our generic, generic formula. Now, if you uh, look in the lab frame, then in the lab frame, we could say that the, the charge Q divided by L lab L A B like this L lab is the charge density in the lab frame of the positive charges, which aren't you know moving relative to us. So that's kind of a nice reference just to think of that. And then what we'll do is we'll look at what the effect is from the moving frame. In other words, a K prime frame that moving charge. If I'm looking at the positive charge from the moving frame. The positive charge is moving to the left at speed V. Since I'm moving to the right at speed V, but I'm relative to myself, I'm at rest, I'm seeing the positive charge is moved to the left at speed V. So that means that the length of the, pos from the positive charge, the next one has been contracted by the Lorentz contraction formula where I use beta, where beta is V over C. Now that takes care of the positive charges. Now for the negative charges, well, I'm watching them go by. They're, they're going by at some you know, velocity total, which I already figured out here with this beta. So from my frame of reference, the negative is going to be a contraction that is more severe. So when I 
and moving with the uh, charge Q, looking at the electrons zipping to the left. Okay, so when I'm looking at those electrons moving, they are spaced at L double prime because that's move when you ride with the electrons. This is the spacing you'd see with the electrons. And I'm moving here relative to that speed at the beta T squared, the combined. So I'm watching the electrons move and they're going to the left. The wire is moving to the left at V and the electrons move at V naught. So I need to do the V and V naught combination to get what I see for the electrons. And then I see the contraction here is the length of the ruler with the electrons like we did for Lorentz contraction. We put this in the moving frame, you know, the L, this is like what the L naught was. And then I'm gonna see the contraction. So this is a somewhat little, little, you know, dancing around here, uh, it takes a little bit of thinking. So that means for the electric field, well, I have one over two pi r, and what we'll do uh, for, for the lambda uh, of the electron, we'll have, say, here, the contra contraction. We're going to have here a Q over 1 minus beta T squared. And down in here will be an L double prime. And then minus will be the Q over this L lab, one minus beta squared. And there's a one over epsilon naught. Now, I really don't want that L double prime in there. So I want to re refer to that to the lab. But if you think about these electrons, they move to the left at V naught relative to the lab. So therefore, the lab is going to see one minus, this is going to be the beta naught squared and multiply by L double prime. This is what we would see in, in the lab, a Lorentz contraction uh, for, for this, uh, these electrons moving. So that means one over L double prime uh, is equal to one minus beta naught squared over L lab. So when we put this in here, we basically have the setup. This is one over two pi R. Let's put the epsilon naught with it from the right and it'll be Q over L lab and here we'll have one minus beta naught squared over the square root of one minus beta T squared minus uh, the one over here, one minus beta squared. Notice that the Q in the lab L goes out. So that's a little tricky, but we're finished. I mean, that's basically, I mean, the, the setup. And now we do some math. And for the math, what we do is we're going to look at this thing. This is one minus beta naught squared. And this down here is a square root of one minus, and now that beta T is, is, is all this stuff. So that's beta naught plus beta over one plus beta naught beta squared. And you're thinking that this is getting very messy. Well, theoretical physics often does, but a lot of times it's gonna simplify. So let's focus on this part down here. If we look at this part down here, just this, this uh, square root part here, where you have the one minus the beta naught plus beta squared over the one plus beta naught beta. If we look at this one, let's see what we got here. We have here a common denominator 
will be one plus beta naught beta squared. And for the one, we'll just work this out. We'll have a one plus two beta naught beta plus beta naught squared beta squared. And now we're gonna subtract this stuff, which is a minus beta naught squared minus two beta naught beta and minus a beta squared. So that will give us everything. So uh, with that, we're going to then see that there are some cancellations. In other words, this thing will cancel with that. And if we pull out what's underneath that radical sign, we have a one plus beta naught squared beta squared minus beta naught squared minus beta squared over one plus beta naught beta squared. That's what's underneath that radical sign. Or if you want, we can just put the radical sign there. Now, if you look at this top thing, this top thing is a one minus beta squared. And then uh, there is a plus beta naught squared beta squared minus one. All right, that's this top piece. So you have one minus beta squared, and then you have plus a beta squared, time, beta naught squared times beta squared minus minus one, or rather minus one. So the one minus beta squared is coming from here, and then the beta naught squared is being factored out with the beta squared you know, minus one in there. But this is then, if you look at this, this is one minus beta squared, and then put a minus sign here, beta naught squared, this is one minus beta squared. So you got the same thing twice. So you have one minus beta squared times one minus beta naught squared. That's kind of cool. And then you still have this denominator down here, beta naught beta squared, and there's a square root sign. So now to sit this back in, we would have here one minus beta naught squared for the up here and then down in here is all this stuff. All this goes down in here. So we're going to be flipping it and we take the square root, we'll have a one plus beta naught beta at the top and then down at the bottom, we'll have a one minus beta naught squared and a one minus beta squared like this. And then we'll have this other piece, one minus beta squared. Now, let's put down everything here that's in front. So here, this is in front, one over two pi r epsilon naught q over l lab, like this. And then here, well, some simplifications here because this thing is gonna cancel this thing. That, that, that goes out. So you have one plus beta naught beta over the square root of one minus beta squared. And this is one over one minus beta squared. That's interesting. It's starting to simplify. So if we go one more step here, we have two pi r epsilon naught q over l lab, and then this gets pulled out, one minus beta squared. And then what we have left is one plus beta naught beta minus one. No way, man, look at that, this cancels. That is very nice. So then you get one over that two pi r epsilon naught q over l lab one minus beta squared beta naught beta. Now the force would be equal to q times e and this is in the moving frame, the K prime frame. And that would, uh, you know, put in 
I'll just go ahead and do this. Put the Q in there. So I have a Q here. So that's the force. And remember that the force in this moving frame would be dp uh, this by the way is a is a sideways situation in other words the force is in the y direction and there's no contraction in the y direction so that's a good thing but there is the t prime you're in the you're in the frame that's moving this way and the electric field and the force are gonna be in Y, so we don't have to worry about any contraction in the Y direction, but we do have to worry about that T. And you might remember that when you're in the lab frame, there's the, well, there's a time dilation. There's this time dilation, you know, going on. So this is the time dilation. So therefore, you have to worry about this. So in other words, the F, the force in the y direction, uh, this t prime is, this is a dt times this, so I could write this as one over one minus beta squared dpy dt. So we're replacing this dt prime with the square root times dt, the square root times dt. And this gets you This gets you the force in the lab frame without the prime, and that's what we want. So therefore, the this is nice because you see this had the one over the square root, so we just go throw that away. See, if you throw that away, so when you have the f, this is the f prime. When you have the f prime, this is y. And if you want the Fy, you just, you have to have this underneath it, but there it is, underneath this, just throw it away, we got it. So this is going to be Q over two pi R epsilon naught Q over L lab beta naught beta. So we just gotta take that out because all this is equal to one over the square root of minus one beta squared times Fy. So we just take that out, we got it. And here, uh, if we go ahead and uh, substitute in, we have Q over two pi R epsilon naught, Q over L lab, and this is V naught over C, because it's the beta definition, and V over C. The next step is I like to regroup Put the Q over the two pi R, and I like to regroup and put the one over epsilon naught here and a C squared next to it. And then what do I have left? I have a Q over L lab and a V naught and a V. So I have this V here, that V naught there, that Q there, the L lab there, and the C squared here, one over epsilon naught, and that Q and the two pi R. And I'm gonna define this as another constant. I'm gonna define this by definition as mu naught, sort of a magnetic, a magnetic constant. Then the force in the Y direction is Q over two pi R mu naught Q over L lab, V naught, V. But if you remember our current definition, the current definition, you know, the Q per time, so the velocity would be the length, you know, between the positive charges over the time, because that was like the time, uh, like charge per time is your is your uh, current. So each charge is L lab apart from each other. So if I take that distance and divide by time, well, that's actually this, 
that's actually the, the velocity, see, because of this charge wind up there in time t, that's the V naught. So therefore, we can replace this with Q over two pi r mu naught, Q over L lab, L lab over T times V. And when these cancel, then Q over T is the current. So come on down here, Fy is Q, 2 pi r mu naught, and Q over T is I, current. I get this formula. And I'm gonna write this formula with the QV first, and then the mu naught I, 2 pi r. And I'm gonna define this as the magnetic field B which you see gets weaker as you get farther from that wire. And since the current goes that way, and this B is a constant B at that distance R, there's a circular symmetry or cylindrical symmetry. So if I make the magnetic field go in this sort of a circular kind of where it say it's coming out of the page here, and this little X means it goes into the page. So if I do like a little like a little loop like this, then we use this notation, mu naught i two pi r theta hat. So theta hat is just simply going along that circle, but the circle is coming. It's going around the it's going around the wire. Like, like this, a little bit hard to draw the perspective. So this represents the magnetic field coming out, and this is going in. But the force is this way. And I'm moving this way. So what they do is if you have the magnetic field into the page, they write this as what they call the cross product, where if you take something going into the page, it's a little bit hard to draw, something into the page, and say I'm moving this way, and this is in this is into the page. Then when you take the cross product, you turn the V, like if you're underneath with a screwdriver, turning the V, tightening into B, then you move up. So that's how they can write the force as Q V cross B. And that's the uh, magnetic uh, field giving you a force because you're moving. And if you don't move, then there is no force. Uh, this is a nice picture. This is a nice picture that helps like understand it. So if the current's coming, say, this way, then you, use, you take your thumb and go with the current, and there it is. So over in this case, if you were going with the current like that, see it came out of the page with that dot, and then coming around, See, we go into the page, you know, there. So there you have the, uh, the magnetic force field. There's the magnitude. Since the V is perpendicular, the cross product, if you have like two vectors, you know, A and B, and you take a cross product, you take A, B, sine of theta, and you go with that, Sometimes I say the right-hand rule. If you take the A into the B, you know, you go up, or you can use the screwdriver underneath with the screwdriver, turn V into B. So that's it. And then you have this uh, general formula. Here's a nice formula that you have Q times E for the Coulomb uh, kind of a force, and then you have this other piece for the magnetic field. That's it. So if we look at this current going this way in the magnetic field, going like that, if we go here along a circumference, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how you can get the rule backwards from the formula. What you do is you put the two pi r on the left side, and you get the mu i, and if you take that b, which is constant at that distance r, 
and go around 2 pi r, that's called a line uh, in integral here. You take the b dot dl. Since the b is lined up and the dl is your little, little vectors here, dls, and since they line up, you uh, have a constant b at that distance r, so you want the circumference. And by doing this, you get a formal version of the law. See, this is the law that when you apply this, you actually derive that. That's what's usually done in the physics courses. And then since if you make a, a spherical uh, you know, surface like that, since the B field never pierces out, that you would have B dot DA would be zero. In other words, that there's no piercing out like when you had the Q you had the electric field piercing out. Here, nothing pierces out, so that's another equation. So there are three equations, see, Maxwell equations, we're building them up. There is a Coulomb decked out, and his tank's closed, Gauss, and there's Ampere. Uh, this is Ampere, uh, uh, Ampere's law, so we, we, we have a name for this. This is uh, Ampere's law that we've looked at. And this here is sometimes called the Lorentz force law, after uh, Lorentz, the, the Lorentz transformation thing. D3 Faraday's law. For Faraday's law, what we do is we consider a magnetic field that's pointed into the page like this. And we have a wire, the loop that we're going to pull to the right with speed V. And this has a width W and the length here is given by the length inside the mag where there's a magnetic field, call that a flux. And we're going to use V cross B to get something cool here. So you have a charge here, Q. Say I have a charge there, Q, and you have a charge there, Q. How does this force field work? Well, if B is into the page and you're moving this way, you're into the page and you're moving that way, you're gonna get the force that's gonna be up like we did before. This is the same kind of thing. We had the wire going this way, the magnetic field was into the page here. And if you're moving that way, the force is up. This wants to pop the wire, this wants to pop the wire, nothing happens, and then doesn't get popped. And then this one here moves this way, you actually make a current. So by doing this, you're actually making a current. And that's uh, the Faraday's law, like you get a current by changing the flux, a magnetic flux through an area. So the magnetic flux, by definition, is to take the magnetic field and multiply it by the area. So here you have it. It's that would be this, the B field pointing into the page times this area. So the force that's pulling us up is Q, V, B, and remember, this is then like the effect of electric field that's, that you can think of as you know, pulling you up. You're generating like an electric field to get this uh, charge moving. That's another way of thinking of this, of this. And the velocity is negative dl dt because as this goes at velocity v, this l decreases. Like the, the l is getting smaller and smaller. So the electric field, which is V times B, is minus dl dt times B. And what we can do here is we can look at this kind of a line integral where this says go along, go along the line. See, so here's your line like this. You go along the line. And here, since the electric field is perpendicular to, you know, going along the line, 
you'd only have a contribution coming from over here. In other words, uh, here you would have no electric field, no force. Here you have electric field perpendicular, and when you have a dot product, you're doing the uh, uh, cosine, cosine of 90 is zero. So here you would be with, so if you consider this lined up here, and this is the width W, then this would get you EW. And then what we can do is put in for the E what this is. This is minus DL DT B times W. Now you can imagine pulling a wire in another direction where the width is changing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring inside that derivative. And this is not a strict definition, I mean derivation. You know, we're just showing you how theoretically you can relate everything together here. So this is not a derivation, formal derivation. And then the next step here is to write this as d dt. This is a length, length times the width is the area times the b. And then you could imagine having the magnetic field increase instead of the area changing. And again, this is not a derivation that's strict. So this is then minus d dt, I'm pulling the b inside, because this is then the flux, the magnetic flux. And if you change the magnetic flux, then you're gonna get the effect. So that would be then E dot DL. So if we look at that equation, E dot DL is minus the derivative of the, the magnetic flux. That's, another, that's the Faraday's law. That's Faraday's law. An, an interesting way to understand this minus sign, Lenz's law, that if you have the situation going on where the flux is decreasing, is de getting less and less into the page, then what I wanna do is I wanna generate a current to oppose that. So in other words, I wanna, wanna, wanna go this way. So if I go this way, then my thumb point in like that that's gonna increase the magnetic field. So that's a neat way to think of that, Lenz's law. And nature always opposes you. So if you wanna decrease the magnetic flux, then you set up a current to increase it. If you want it to go the other way and increase the flux, then you're gonna then uh, you know, go this way to oppose the, the magnetic field and, and do the opposite. Okay, one, one last piece and we're finished. And that is the displacement current. Uh, before we do that, let's just show you Faraday. There you go, Michael Faraday. And this piece is due to uh, Maxwell and they name all the equations after him, <laughs> the Maxwell equations. And this involves uh, looking at the electric field that's set up if you have a plate that has a charge that has, say, charge uh, sigma as an aerial density, sort of surface density. Then you would have, if you make, go ahead and make a little, like, box that actually goes uh, here underneath the surface too. This is the Gaussian surface. Since here your electric field would point up, and there underneath it would point down. So when you do your Gauss's law, E dot dA is equal to the charge inside over epsilon naught, you would have uh, two of these. E goes up, but the area vector goes up, that's together, and here, you know, the area vector go down, but the E goes down, because you remember, you're always pointing if you have a, a cube or something like this, you always point away from the center. So therefore you'll have here two 
E A, and the charge would be some sigma times the area over epsilon naught. So you get the electric field to be sigma over two epsilon naught. And if this is an infinite plane, then that's gonna be a constant, say electric field above and below pointing away. Now the question is, we know that a current can get you a magnetic, fee a magnetic field. Say so here's a current I. Question is, if you are putting charge on this plate, this is a, this is a plate. Think of this as a the edge of a plate, and here current you know is leaving, so you have a negative. What happens inside here? What's going on in here? In other words, do you still get um, a magnetic field set up like you would expect? I mean, there's a gap in there. Uh, so here, you know, you're going to get your, you're going to get your B dot DL is mu naught I. So B, we worked this out already. You get, you get this. So the electric field here, since we have two plates, it's going to be double. So your electric field, Electric field here. Remember, electric field, if you have a plus charge, where does it go? Well, once it get away from there, once it go to, to the right. So your electric field is going to be this way. And since there's two plates reinforcing, you're going to get that. Okay, now the question is, let's look uh, here, get our charge density. It's going to be Q over A. Just have that ready, handy. And let's calculate the electric flux. Now the flux, electric flux, is simply going to be the electric field, that we know what it is, uh, times uh, area. And you just take, you know, you take a little area uh, in there, and just like we, you know, had a little area there, you could look at this as some little area there. And let's uh, take the derivative of the electric flux with respect to time, and it would be this derivative. The area is not gonna change, but what we do have is the E is gonna be sigma over epsilon naught, and epsilon naught's a constant, but if we write here, we can replace the sigma uh, as equal to the charge divided by the area. Now the areas are going to cancel and we're going to get the derivative of Q with respect to time. That's current. All right. Now that's interesting because if we look at this, there's not really an I between the plates. Isn't that wild? but it's like there's this flux thing going on and there's like this effective current. So let's write this down. There's a change in flux. What inspired here, Maxwell's looking at this current, like it, you have an effective current here that's coming from the change in the electric flux. So then if you look at this kind of an equation, which had a mu naught i, he's saying we should really add that i in there because to be complete, you're finding that you have an effective current when you have this situation. So that means if we add that piece in there like this, we would have mu naught i, that's, that's the regular one that we have here. It's the regular one, but then we're gonna add for the other i, now there's a mu naught in the formula, so it'd be mu naught and epsilon naught, and then the change in the electric flux. Now, when you do that, you have the last Maxwell equation. Uh, here's a nice summary. Coulomb's law in the form of Gauss's law. Here, the magnetic field doesn't pierce outwards, all circular. Here, the extra piece added called the displacement current to get the full 
Maxwell equation, the Ampere's law plus the displacement current, and here's Faraday's law, and here's the Lorentz force. That's it. This is beautiful. And you'll study this in more detail, working out the details in your uh, physics courses if you are taking physics.